Hello, everyone. We're honored today to have with us Ms. Holly McKay, and she's the author of the book Only Cry for the Living. And she's a journalist, and she's been around the world doing journalism. And we're bringing her on today to talk about what's going on over there in Ukraine and uh, her insights and observations so that we could get many different sides of what we're hearing and seeing. So thank you very much for being here today, Holly. Uh, when was the last time you were in uh, Ukraine? Uh, I just got back a few days ago. So I've been pretty much there since January and uh, took a, a small break He's sort of in the middle in, in late February. But, um, but aside from that, I spent most of this year there and uh, we'll just have a, a few days off and then heading back again probably at the end of this week. Are you going to go back to Ukraine? I think so, yeah. Wow. And how did you get out? Did you have to go through Poland to get out or could you fly I out? I did. It was honestly a nightmare. The getting out was the probably the most challenging part um, just because there was sort of a little bit of confusion over um, how... You know the cost that you know the costs were going up for foreigners to kind of be able to get cars to drive and being an independent journalist you don't have sort of all the resources of a, of a network or a large company so um, I was a little bit concerned that if the train stopped running and you know well, how much the, the cost would be in trying to to drive from Kiev all the way to Poland which is a really significant drive so I ended up kind of with with all the refugees just how other people get out which was on the train and it's about a 15 hour ride and it was sort of very last minute for me. So I was a little bit ill prepared. I didn't have water or food or anything. So it was wow. it was a long journey. And then I sort of got to Lviv at 3 a.m. in the morning and then had to sort of sleep in the station and wait for um, daylight so that I could find a cab to then drive me a couple more hours to the border. So it was definitely a very, very exhausting process that, that a lot of people every single day have to go through. Were there concerns about, you know, on the escape route out that, um, you know, you would be stopped by uh, bombs or anything of that kind of nature? I mean, I think generally that part of the country as you sort of go down south and then west um, is, is fairly untouched by the conflict that's obviously ravaging the east side of the country. Um, there always is that concern. And certainly when I finally got to the border in Poland, there were air raid sirens happening then. And so we sort of had to sit there for an hour and, and kind of wait for those to dissipate so that we could cross. Um, but generally that area, while it has been hit on several occasions, it's, uh, it's generally considered to be significantly safer than, than certainly the east side and, and anywhere near Kiev right now. Now, before you were in, you said you were there since January. Were you there in Ukraine before January, before this time? I have visited once before. So I sort of had a little bit of a network there and, and friends from, from a few years ago um, while I was actually doing some work in Russia. And then I went to Ukraine after that. Your insights of what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, I think it's really it's really a devastating situation, and it's one of those situations where it really was an unprovoked war. There was no need for any of this suffering to happen. And as much as we sort of hear about these heroic tales of Ukraine now a month into the conflict, being able to push Russia back, which I think nobody ever expected that they were able to do that, um, which they're really holding out, and in some cases even going on the offensive, but I think at the end of the day, you know, there are no winners in this war and, and Ukraine may or may not succeed in, in completely driving out Russian troops. But certainly, you know, that isn't necessarily a victory or a win for them because you can see so many of their cities have been flattened. Um, so many lives have been lost and, and businesses broken down. And it's just a, it's a country now that revolves entirely around a war. And there is really no other life beyond that. And it's going to be incredibly difficult, I think, moving forward for Ukrainians to ever be able to, to really trust their Russian neighbors again. And so I think this is something that, that isn't going to be over in a matter of weeks or even months. This is something that is going to have huge ramifications for Europe and the rest of the world for a really long time to come. And it's, it's just a really, really, really sad situation. And you see so many of the most vulnerable people in the world. So elderly, disabled, um, pets, children, 
that are just suffering hugely as a result of this and, and living in bunkers and, and being rescued. And it's just, there's so many different layers of trauma. It's very hard to, to process at times. You, in reading some of what you've written, you, you talked about um, for several days, one of the women had been asking the garden, Rus garden Russians if they could return to their homes to collect some belongings and personal items, to which the soldiers refused. Finally, one snapped and said, if the woman asked again, they will take all the men from the bunker and line them up in the streets and proceed to shoot them randomly in an apparent game of Russian roulette. Mm. And I was just, I was hearing these stories so often from people that were in areas that had come under Russian occupation. And I was very curious to try to understand what life was like living under the Russians very suddenly. And, and it seemed to be, there were a lot of common denominators. And one of them was that the first thing that the Russian soldiers would do often was that they would come to these homes. And mind you, these people have no electricity, no heat, you know, no food, nothing. And the Russians would come and want to sort of do inventory on who was there. And then they would take their phones from them and then, you know, proceed to take their clothing and their food and just put them in, a, you know, even a deeper place of misery. And then these tales of, of just sort of random shooting, somebody being on a balcony, having a cigarette and getting shot. Um, someone else told me about a, a neighbor of his who was trying to deliver bread to a neighboring village and the Russians considered him an activist and shot him. And almost everybody that I talked to that tried to escape even through these quote unquote humanitarian corridors were being shot at by the Russians. So it just shows you just how widespread the violence is and really just how terrifying and, and precarious it is and that you can see how really desperate the Russian forces are at this point because they are um, you know, very much behind their military goals and they don't seem to A, have the resources or B, really understand what to do once they occupy an area. So um, it's just, it's terribly traumatic for people. And, and mind you, when they do leave these places, when they are evacuated, they don't have anywhere to go. You know, they may go to a quote unquote, slightly safer place, but they don't know, they don't have a home to go to. There's no displacement camp for them. So it's just sort of one snowball after another. And it's it's just really hard to, to think this is happening in Europe in 2022. What about, uh, where, where were you in Ukraine as all this is going on? Um, so for the kind of first part of the year before the full-scale invasion, I spent most of that in Donbass in the east, which was already at war. And then, right, let, me, uh, let me stop right there. Yeah. Um, because we keep hearing you were in Donbass, and what we keep hearing from the other side is that Donbass has been under uh, uh, kind of continuing attack from Ukraine. Is that um, true? It, it, yeah, so not all of it. So um, there are certain parts of it, uh, Donetsk and, and, and another area that have been, they kind of occupied by pro-separatists. And then there are other cities just around that that are still under fire, but they remain under Ukrainian occupation. So those sort of two main areas um, is what Russia is now trying to claim and wanting to essentially fold into Russian territory. And that may end up being a, a major negotiation point between Kiev and Moscow once they nut out sort of the terms to to try to stop this war. So those areas are what they consider to be occupied by not Russians, by, but by pro-Russian separatists. Um, but essentially they, they are supported by Moscow. Um, and so then once the invasion sort of happened, and that was in on February 24th that began, um, I basically stayed sort of in that Kiev area and was sort of covering um, most of the city and then areas around that, which were under sort of heavy bombardment um, in Kiev Oblast. So I, I kind of stayed around the capital. So you watched, so you were there as the place is getting bombed? Essentially, yes. I mean, the capital itself, I mean, there is a lot of artillery and, and certainly random bombings that happen, but the capital itself is so far it's holding and isn't necessarily in a in a, a huge state of kinetic war, but around the city, you know, 20 minutes outside of it, 
um, you have a lot of different smaller towns, villages, and and cities that are under very very heavy uh, Russian shelling, and and in some areas Russian forces have occupied those areas, and that's sort of been I think a slow build up of Russian troops that are, are trying to kind of get into the city, but once again I don't think had anticipated the sort of resistance that they were going to get from the Ukrainians and and how really how effective a lot of the javelins and the stingers and the the sort of the anti-tank missile systems that nato uh, countries have given ukraine have really been um in knocking out russian air power so it's a it's a, certainly a tumultuous kind of situation there what i read today is that um according from the russian side that they have just eliminated the ukrainian air uh, and sea forces that they they don't exist anymore. I don't know if it's true or not. It's always hard to say, and I and I find that I often have to kind of take a little bit uh, anything that both comes out of Kiev and Moscow. It's important to sort of take with a little a lot of skepticism, really, because both governments certainly have their own agenda and narrative, and and are putting forth how their version of events. So I think you know you have to treat any of these official statements with a little bit of skepticism because um, it's very hard to to kind of verify anything that is being said and you certainly have to take into account the very different agendas and, and that the both sides are, are painting very different pictures as to as to what is happening. Um, and you know for me it's certainly very clear that Russia um, isn't advancing anywhere near the degree to which they thought they would, but it is also very clear to me that 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 has evolved into a tactic of a really decimating areas and absolutely shelling very indiscriminately, and, and oftentimes it's civilians who are targeted in in those attacks. So I think we're probably going to see a lot more attacks on civilians just because um, I think Russia is grasping at straws in in trying to to bring Ukraine to its knees. Do you think the Ukrainian army will defeat the Russian army? I know that that's sort of the popular narrative. Um, and and I think that every Ukrainian you meet is just is so willing to fight or play some sort of role in this war. Um, I think there is absolutely no way that they're going to just kind of fall and, and accept whatever Moscow brings upon them. So in that case, even if they were to get in, you're looking at a very brutal and long guerrilla war um, that would go for a very long time. So I certainly don't see a Russian victory in any sort of way, shape or form with their current military goals. Um, but I'm also hesitant to, to kind of paint in, in big glorious terms any kind of huge scale Ukrainian victory either, because I think we are only really um, hearing about the wins. And I think that Russia still has a very formidable presence and they certainly have um, a lot of air power. So I think it's a little premature um, to sort of say that, that Ukraine is necessarily going to win or win anytime soon. As I see it from my end, um, I don't know why there is not a ceasefire for peace. Mm -hmm. uh, I, again, I'm totally opposed to Russia's invasion, uh, just as I am totally opposed to America's invasions of all the countries that they've invaded. And I've also launched Occupy Peace. So I put my money in my heart where my mouth is. And to me, as I see it as from my end, as I'm watching, listening to you and others, is that there should be a negotiation for some kind of a peace. I, I tell the story, of, there's a famous chart of Napoleon's march to Moscow when he leaves Poland with 420,000 troops. Mm -hmm. He comes back with 10,000. Then there was Adolf Hitler's Operation Barbarossa that killed 27 million Russians. And they were the first ones to conquer Germany. So to me, it's all of this armaments that are being sent in to keep escalating this war. And you mentioned about the, the missiles, et cetera. Are they really effective? To me, it's making a bad situation worse. And I'm very sad that 
there's no really pushing for peace. And so I'm concerned also that this might be the beginning of World War III because they're really ratcheting up on the NATO end. And um, uh, anyway, that's just, you know, mm -hmm. from so hearing what you're well, saying. Yeah. And it is concerning, and a ceasefire really has to be the first piece of a puzzle in ending the war. I mean, you can't really negotiate terms of ending a war while there's still sort of huge amounts exactly. of conflict happening. And so that yeah. really, you know, that is sort of the first cornerstone or that or just a... Um, you know, it, it, maybe even if it's not a full scale, uh, but just sort of ratcheting down the hostilities to at least begin with. But right now, with the violence at the level it is, it's very hard to to kind of negotiate any terms for a Russian exit. Yeah, well, I don't think Russia is going to exit at all. Mm -hmm. And um, as you said, you know, it'll be going on for a guerrilla war, even if they win. And yeah, so just but I make... mean, Russia has just sustained so many losses of its own. Of its own troops. I mean, it's very, again, a modest, I think, figure would be at least um, 10,000, probably to 12,000. Ukrainians wow. get a lot more than that, but I, I know sort of US intelligence assessments have it around that. That's huge. I mean, that we look at the US lost about 2,500 soldiers in Afghanistan over 20 years. And I mean, that, you know, was obviously. Have too many to lose too but this is in in less than a month you're looking at four five times that and sadly a lot of these russians are, are conscripts you know these are young men with uh with very limited training no choice to join the military that are being um sent off to war and you know that is going to drastically i mean and also russia has just lost so much of its equipment as well so not only personnel equipment it's just it's absolutely uh dilapidated the the russian army and I, I it's going to that in itself i don't know how putin is going to to kind of address that to the russian people and uh, once this is all done and dusted well i don't think he cares about addressing it to the russian people and he'll do what he wants but again, the numbers also that you're, that, that you're mentioning, I don't know if they're true or not also because they are coming from, as you mentioned, American intelligence. So, you know, we, we could be getting skewed sides from both sides. So I'm very hesitant to, to believe what they say because I also know that they've, they have a quite a, a pretty good track record of you know, Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. has weapons of mass destruction and ties to Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, you know, I hear what you're saying and I see that the destruction is terrible. And I'm just hoping that, you know, hope, hope is the most negative word in the dictionary, metaphysical dictionary. I, 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 it would be wonderful if they would start talking from both NATO's end and, uh, um, and Russia's end for a ceasefire and try mm -hmm. to negotiate for peace. And I never hear that from anybody. Right. Yeah, I think it's, you know, that's also, it's it's very important to, to sort of get to that point. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know Zelensky's willingness to sort of give up any territory or to kind of make any of the concessions Russia wants um, in order to get to that point. So it, yeah, it is a very, uh, difficult sort of situation and, and you know we also can look in hindsight of what could have been said or done before this that, that may have prevented um, what's happening um, yes. again it's all, it's all 2020 hindsight but I hope that we can take away lessons from this in in terms of what um, you know if a situation like this comes up again you know what world leaders sort of have to do and say and, and concede upon uh, so we never get to this point because this it just should not be happening in this day and age. No, it should not be happening. And my, again, my great concern is this is the beginning of World War III. You yeah. know, I'm born in 1946, one year after World War II. That's not ancient history. No. And you go to Berlin, you know, which I've been to and, and other places in, in Germany and seeing these. Berlin was grander than Paris before it was bombed out. No. You know, you're losing the war. Why didn't they stop it before a Dresden and all of this other things? And now with the new weaponry of the uh, 21st century, they asked uh, Albert Einstein, what weapons will be used to fight the Third World War? He said, I don't know. He said, mm. but they'll be using sticks and stones to fight the fourth. Mm. 
And that's my, and I, so for me, you know, we really need to hear more about peace and only cry for the living is Holly McKay's book. And I would really suggest that that's a very important statement to make and a book to read. And I also want everyone to know that we also have a brand new Substack newsletter where we post updated trend forecasts throughout the entire work week. And it's at trends in the news, substack.com trends in the news substack.com so we'll see you there and thank you again holly and of course I, I you know all the best to you and you're going back to ukraine and your safety and and um and those of the ukraine people again i i'm a uh, i'm a warrior for the prince of peace and uh no one seems to be talking about it right now and to me that's what's needed the most Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.